Okay, tonight is the twenty-first of August, and uh, it's also the thirty-third uh, talk uh, in the series. Uh, this Sangitan, uh, this uh, Majima Nikaya. Now we come to Sutta number seventy-nine, Chula Sakulu Dai Sutta, the shorter discourse to Sakulu Dain. This sutta, <coughs> this sutta is a bit humorous. Uh. Thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was living at, Raj at Rajagaha in the bamboo grove, the squirrel sanctuary. Now on that occasion, the wanderer Sakulu Dain was staying in the peacock sanctuary, the wanderer's park, with a large assembly of wanderers. Then when it was morning, the Blessed One dressed and taking his bowl and outer robe, went to Rajagaha for arms. Then he thought, it is still too early to wander for arms in Rajagaha. Suppose I went to the wanderer Sakulu Dain in the peacock sanctuary, the wanderer's park. Then the Blessed One went to the peacock sanctuary, the wanderer's park. Now on that occasion, the wanderer Sakulu Dain was seated with a large assembly of wanderers who were making an uproar. As before, they're talking uh, all kinds of talk. And the Buddha came, uh, and and then they quietened down. For what discussion are you sitting together here now, Udain? And what was your discussion that was interrupted? Venerable Sir, let be the discussion for which we are now sitting together here. The Blessed One can well hear about it later. Venerable Sir, when I do not come to this assembly, then it sits talking many kinds of pointless talk. But when I have come to this assembly, then it sits looking up to me, thinking, let us hear the Dhamma that the recluse Udayan expounds. However, when the Blessed One comes, then both I and this assembly sit looking up to the Blessed One, thinking, let us hear the Dhamma that the Blessed One expounds. I'll stop here for a moment. So this um, Udayan uh, is telling a lie here. Says, uh, when he's with the assembly, uh, they all keep quiet and wait to hear for his, to hear his Dhamma. Uh, he didn't know that the Buddha can read, can read his mind. Uh, then Udayan suggests something that I should speak about. Noble Sir, in recent days there has been one claiming to be omniscient and all-seeing, to have complete knowledge and vision thus, whether I am walking or standing or sleeping or awake. Knowledge and vision are continuously and uninterruptedly present to me. When I asked him a question about the past, he prevaricated, let the talk aside and showed anger, hate and bitterness. Then I remembered the Blessed One thus, Ah, surely it is the Blessed One, surely it is, it is the Sublime One who is skilled in these things. But Udayan, who was it that claimed to be omniscient and all-seeing? Yet when asked a question by you about the past, prevaricated, let the talk aside and showed anger, hate and bitterness. It was Niganta Nataputta, Venerable Sir. Stop here for a moment. Uh, during the Buddha's days, uh, there were six famous external ascetic teachers, uh, and some of them, like this Niganta Nataputta, uh, they claim to be all knowing, uh, uh, omniscient, all seeing, etc. But when you asked, like when this uh, Sakulu Dain asked him some questions he could not answer, then he prevaricated and showed anger. Udayan, if someone should recollect his manifold past lives, that is, one bird, two birds, etc., thus with his aspects and particulars, should he recollect his manifold past lives, then either he might ask me a question about the past, or I might ask him a question about the past, and he might satisfy my mind with his answer to my question, or I might satisfy his mind with my answer to his question. If someone had the divine eye, which is purified and surpasses the human, should see beings passing away and reappearing, inferior and superior, fair and ugly, fortunate and unfortunate, etc., and understand how beings pass on according to their actions, then either he might ask me a question about the future, or I might ask him a question about the future, and he might satisfy my mind with his answer to my question, or I might satisfy his mind 
with my answer to his question. But let be the past who die, let be the future. I shall teach you the Dhamma. When this exists, that comes to be. With the arising of this, that arises. When this does not exist, that does not come to be. With the cessation of this, that ceases. And Udayan said, Venerable Sir, I cannot even recollect with the aspects and particulars all that I have experienced within this present existence. So how should I recollect my manifold past lives? That is, one birth, two births, etc. with the aspects and particulars, as the Blessed One does. And I cannot now even see a mud goblin. So how should I, with the divine eye, which is purified and surpasses the human, see beings passing away and reappearing, inferior and superior, fair and ugly, fortunate and unfortunate, etc., and understand how beings pass on according to their actions, as the Blessed One does? But, Venerable Sir, let the Blessed One when the Blessed One told me, let be the past who dying, let be the future, I shall teach you the Dhamma. When this exists, that comes to be. With the arising of this, that arises. When this does not exist, that does not come to be. With the cessation of this, that ceases. That is even more unclear to me. Perhaps, Venerable Sir, I might satisfy the Blessed One's mind by answering a question about our own teacher's doctrine. Stop here for a moment. Now. So here... The Buddha, <coughs> since, uh, since this uh, Udayan, uh, he said, uh, he asked this uh, Niganta Nataputta a question about a past, the past, uh, and Niganta Nataputta could not answer uh, and showed anger. So the Buddha said, uh, uh, if someone wants to discuss the uh, past with me, uh, he should be able to recollect his past lives uh, like the Buddha is able to. Uh, then uh, they can discuss about the past. Uh. Or if somebody wants to discuss about the future, uh, he should be, be able to have the divine eye or heavenly eye uh, can see into the future. Uh. But if not, uh, then um, you cannot really discuss about the past and the future. Uh. But the Buddha said, forget about that. Uh. Let's talk about this uh, dependent origination. Uh. Then this uh, Udayan said, nah, he cannot recollect his past, nah. even this present life also, he cannot recollect uh, well. Nah. And uh, as, as for the divine eye, nah, he said he cannot even see a mud goblin uh, spirit nah, in the mud. Nah. Nah, how can he see uh, uh, with the heavenly eye? Nah. And then he says, uh, when the Buddha talks about dependent origination, nah, when this exists, that comes to be the arising of this, that arises, etc. Nah. He said there's even more unclear to him. <laughs> so he said uh, maybe he can uh, ask the Buddha about his own teacher's doctrine. Mm. Well, Udain, what is taught in your own teacher's doctrine? Venerable Sir, it is taught that in our own teacher's doctrine, this is the perfect splendor. This is the perfect splendor. But Udain, since it is taught in your teacher's doctrine, this is the perfect splendor. This is the perfect splendor. What is that perfect splendor? Venerable Sir, that splendor is the perfect splendor which is unsurpassed by any other splendor, higher and more sublime. But Udain, what is that splendor which is unsurpassed by any other splendor, higher and more sublime? Venerable Sir, that splendor is the perfect splendor which is unsurpassed by any other splendor, higher or more sublime. And the Buddha said, Udain, you might continue for a long time in this way. You say, Remember, sir, that splendor is the perfect splendor which is unsurpassed by any other splendor, higher or more sublime. Yet you do not indicate what that splendor is. Suppose a man were to say, I am in love with the most beautiful girl in this country. Then they would ask him, Good man, that most beautiful girl in this country with whom you are in love, do you know whether she is from the noble class or from the Brahmin class or from the merchant class or from the worker class? And he would reply, no. Then they would ask him, good man, that most beautiful girl in this country with whom you are in love, do you, do you know her name and clan, whether she is tall or short or of middle height, whether she is dark or brown or golden skin, what village or town or city she lives in? And he would reply no to each of the questions. And then they would ask him, Good man, do you then love a girl you have never known or seen? And he would reply, yes. 
What do you think, Udain? That being so, would not that man's talk amount to nonsense? Surely, Venerable Sir, that being so, that man's talk would amount to nonsense. But in the same way, Udain, you say thus, that splendor is the perfect splendor which is unsurpassed by any other splendor, higher or more sublime. Yet you do not indicate what that splendor is. Venerable Sir, just as a beautiful barrel gem of purest water, eight-faceted, well-cut, lying on red brocade, glows, radiates and shines, of such splendor is the self surviving unimpaired after death. I'll stop here for a moment. So here he's talking about perfect, the perfect splendor, but he cannot really tell the Buddha what is that perfect splendor. And the Buddha said they are talking nonsense, just like this man who says he's in love with the most beautiful girl, but cannot describe that girl. So he had no choice. He was cornered. He had to come up with an answer. So he gave this simile of the beautiful beryl gem. This beryl gem is a transparent precious stone and it's lying on red brocade, a red piece of cloth. So in the daylight, it will seem to glow and radiate and shine. And this, he is talking about the self surviving unimpaired after death. I mean the soul in their teaching, the soul is the perfect splendor. What do you think, Udain? This beautiful barrel gem of purest water, eight-faceted, well-cut, lying on a red brocade, which glows, radiates, and shines, or a glow-worm in the thick darkness of the night, of these two, which gives off the splendor which is more excellent and sublime. And he thought for a while, and he said, the glow-worm in the thick darkness of the night, Venerable Sir. Stop here for a moment. So, this beautiful barrel gem that he described, uh, that glows and radiates and shines. Uh, that is only so uh, in the bright daylight. Uh, but in the thick darkness of the night, uh, you cannot even see it. So how can it uh, shine or radiate? Uh, but in the thick darkness of the night, uh, the glow worm that moves slowly, uh, uh, it, it glows. Uh, so at least the glow worm, uh, you can see. It. So the glow worm is brighter uh, than this uh, pearl gem. Uh. What do you think, Udayan? This glow worm in the thick darkness of the night, or an oil lamp in the thick darkness of the night, of these two, which gives off the splendor that is more excellent and sublime? The oil lamp, Venerable Sir. What do you think, Udayan? This oil lamp in the thick darkness of the night, or the great bonfire in the thick darkness of the night, of these two, which gives off the splendor that is more excellent and sublime? The great bonfire, Venerable Sir. What do you think, Udayan? This great bonfire in the thick darkness of the night, or the morning star towards dawn in a, in a clear, cloudless sky, of these two which gives off the splendor that is more excellent and sublime. The morning star towards dawn in a clear, cloudless sky, Venerable Sir. What do you think, Udayan? The morning star towards dawn in a clear, cloudless sky, or the full moon at midnight, in a clear, cloudless sky on the Uposatha day of the 15th, of these two, which gives off the splendor that is more excellent and sublime. The full moon at midnight in a clear, cloudless sky on the Uposatha day of the 15th, Venerable Sir. What do you think, Udain? The full moon at midnight in a clear, cloudless sky on the Uposatha day of the 15th, or the full disk of the sun at midday in a clear, cloudless sky in autumn in the last month of the rainy season. Of these two, which gives off the splendor that is more excellent and sublime. The full disk of the sun at midday in a clear, cloudless sky in autumn, in the last month of the rainy season, Venerable Sir. Beyond this, Udain, I know of very many gods whose splendor the radiance of the sun and moon does not match. Yet I do not say that there is no other splendor, higher or more sublime than that splendor. But you, Udain, Say of the splendor which is lower and meaner than a glowworm's. This is the perfect splendor. <laughs> Yet you do not indicate what that splendor is. The blessed one has terminated the discussion. The sublime one has terminated the discussion. But Udain, why do you say that? 
Venerable Sir, it is taught in our own teacher's doctrine, this is the perfect splendor, this is the perfect splendor. But on being pressed and questioned and cross-questioned about our own teacher's doctrine by the Blessed One, we are found empty, hollow and mistaken. <coughs> So the Buddha shows him how silly uh, his perfect splendor is. Uh, cannot even compare to the glow worm. How is it, Udayan? Is there an entirely pleasant world? Is there a practical way to realize an entirely pleasant world? Honorable Sir, it is taught in our own teacher's doctrine. There is an entirely pleasant world. There is a practical way to realize an entirely pleasant world. But Udayan, what is that practical way to realize an entirely pleasant world? Here, Venerable Sir, abandoning the killing of living beings, someone abstains from killing living beings. Abandoning the taking of what is not given, he abstains from taking what is not given. Abandoning misconduct in sensual pleasures, he abstains from misconduct in sensual pleasures. Abandoning false speech, he abstains from false speech. Or else he undertakes and practices some kind of asceticism. This is the practical way to realize an entirely pleasant world. What do you think, Udayan? On an occasion when he abandons the killing of living beings and abstains from killing living beings, does his self then feel only pleasure or both pleasure and pain? Both pleasure and pain, Venerable Sir. What do you think, Udain? On an occasion when he abandons the taking of what is not given and abstains from taking what is not given, when he abandons misconduct in sensual pleasures and abstains from misconduct in sensual pleasures, when he abandons false speech and abstains from false speech, does itself then feel only pleasure <coughs> or both pleasure and pain? Both pleasure and pain, Venerable Sir. What do you think, Udayan? On an occasion when he undertakes and practices some kind of asceticism, does itself then feel only pleasure or both pleasure and pain? Both pleasure and pain, Venerable Sir. What do you think, Udayan? Does the realization of an entirely pleasant world come about by falling away of mixed pleasure and pain? The Blessed One has terminated the discussion. The Sublime One has terminated the discussion. But Udayan, why do you say that? Venerable Sir, it is taught in our own teacher's doctrine. There is an entirely pleasant world. There is a practical way to realize an entirely pleasant world. But on being pressed and questioned and cross-questioned about our own teacher's doctrine by the Blessed One, we are found empty, hollow and mistaken. Stop here for a moment. So here, the Buddha is making him see uh, that when he practices these precepts, uh, this person, uh, he feels both pleasure and pain. Since he is feeling both pleasure and pain uh, here and now, uh, so it is expected uh, that when he passes away, uh, he will feel both pleasure and pain. Uh, so, this uh, brings to mind, uh, like the people like to chant, uh, Amitabha Buddha's name, uh, hoping to be reborn in the pure land, in the high heaven. But right now, uh, you can see from this sutta, if you are chanting Amitabha's name, uh, you are feeling pleasant as well as pain uh, in this present lifetime. So that being so, uh, it is expected uh, when you pass away, uh, you will also experience both pleasure and pain. Uh. On the other hand, uh, the Buddha's disciples, uh, they can reach uh, high states of uh, jhana, where they feel only bliss. Uh, in that case, uh, then they can be reborn in the world of bliss. La. But how is it, Venerable Sir? Is there an entirely pleasant world? Is there a practical way to realize an entirely pleasant world? There is an entirely pleasant world, Udain. There is a practical way to realize an entirely pleasant world. Venerable Sir, what is that practical way to realize an entirely pleasant world? Here, Udain. Quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, a monk enters upon and abides in the first jhana. With the stilling of applied and sustained thought, he enters upon and abides in the second jhana, in the third jhana. This is the practical way to realize an entirely pleasant world. Remember, sir, that is not the practical way to realize an entirely pleasant world. At that point, an entirely pleasant world has already been realized. Udain, at that point, an entirely pleasant world has not yet been realized. That is only the practical way to realize an entirely pleasant world. 
When this was said, the wanderer Sakulu Dain's assembly made an uproar, saying very loudly and noisily, We are lost along with our own teachers' doctrines. We are lost along with our own teachers' doctrines. We know nothing higher than that. I'll stop here for a moment. So here, Udain is discussing with the Buddha all this uh, about the Dhamma and his uh, disciples uh, couldn't understand a word of it. <laughs> so they are feeling very lost. Uh, and they say they know nothing higher than their own teacher's doctrines. Uh. Then the wanderers, Hakulu Dain, quieted those wanderers and asked the Blessed One, Venerable Sir, at what point is an entirely pleasant world realized? Here, Udain, with the abandoning of pleasure and pain, and with the previous disappearance of joy and grief, a monk enters upon and abides in the fourth jhana, which has neither pain nor pleasure, and utter purity of mindfulness and equanimity. He dwells with those deities who have arisen in an entirely pleasant world, and he talks with them, and enters into conversation with them. It is at this point that an entirely pleasant world has been realized. I'll stop here for a moment now. So here, when a person attains the fourth jhana, the Buddha says, uh, an entirely pleasant world has been realized, not in, even in the third jhana. According to the commentary of the Majjhima Nikaya, they say, uh, why the Buddha says, uh, at this point, an uh, entirely pleasant world has been realized, they say because when somebody <coughs> attains the fourth jhana, uh, he goes for rebirth in the third jhana heaven, uh, which is entirely pleasant. But this uh, uh, doesn't seem to have much basis in the suttas. In the suttas, I think in the Anguttara Nikaya, there's one sutta where the Buddha says, uh, when a person attains the fourth jhana, and when he comes out of the fourth jhana, if he sits, uh, he sits on a celestial couch. If he walks, he walks on a celestial couch. When he stands, is also like in heaven. When he lies down, is also like in a celestial couch, like in heaven. In other words, uh, he's, he's, um, he's, he's totally uh, in comfort, like, totally blissed out, like, even when he just comes out of the fourth jhana. That's why uh, he's as though he's, entirely, he's in an entirely pleasant world. Like. Besides that, uh, when a person attains a fourth jhana, the Buddha says uh, the uh, divine eye, a spiritual eye, opens. La. Although not for all monks, la. Uh, maybe half of them. La. And then uh, because of this divine eye, uh, he can see devas and devis uh, and talk with them. La. Uh, so it's, it's, it's as though he's already in heaven. Uh. Venerable Sir, surely it is for the sake of realizing that entirely pleasant world that monks lead the holy life under the Blessed One. It is not for the sake of realizing the entirely pleasant world that monks lead the holy life under me. There are other states who dine higher and more sublime than that. And it is for the sake of realizing them that monks lead the holy life under me. What are those higher and more sublime states, Venerable Sir, for the sake of realizing which monks lead the holy life under the Blessed One? Here, Udain, Tathagata appears in the world, Arahan Samasambuddha. Uh, so, here, uh, as in Sutta 51, uh, uh, section 12 to 19, uh, the Buddha describes how a lay person hears the Dhamma and then he has faith and renounces uh, and practices a spiritual path. Uh. Having thus abandoned these five hindrances, imperfections of the mind that weaken wisdom, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, a monk enters upon and abides in the first jhana. This Udayan is a high and most sublime state for the sake of realizing which monks lead the holy life under me. Again, with the stilling of applied and sustained thought, a monk enters upon and abides in the second jhana, third jhana, fourth jhana. This too, Dayan, is a high and more sublime state for the sake of realizing which monks lead the holy life under me. Stop here for a moment. Nah. So here, why is it nah, the Buddha describes the first jhana, second jhana, third jhana, fourth jhana? Because earlier he already talked about having attained the fourth jhana. But just now they were talking about entirely pleasant world, lah. That's that, that pleasurable state, lah. that pleasant state. Lah. The Buddha says uh, it is not for that pleasant state lah, that monks uh, lead the holy life, lah, but for the purpose of attaining these jhanas, lah, because these jhanas lead to wisdom. Lah. 
lead to, uh, lead to the abandoning of the hindrances lah. Uh, when his concentrated mind is thus purified, bright, unblemished, rid of imperfection, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imperturbability, he directs it to the knowledge of the recollection of past lives. He recollects his manifold past lives as one birth, two births, three, hundred thousands, etc. Thus, with the aspects and particulars, he recollects his manifold past lives. This too, Dain, is a higher and more sublime state for the sake of realizing which monks lead the holy life under me. When his concentrated mind is thus purified, bright, unblemished, rid of imperfection, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imperturbability, directs it to the knowledge of passing away and reappearance of beings, etc. Thus, with the divine eye or heavenly eye, which is purified and surpasses the human, he sees beings passing away and reappearing, inferior and superior, fair and ugly, fortunate and unfortunate. And he understands how beings pass on according to their actions or karma. This too, Dain, is a higher and more sublime state for the sake of realizing which monks lead the holy life under me. So you see, you notice here, huh? pay attention here, huh? that actually the purpose huh, of the holy life huh, is to realize the jhanas, as stated very clearly by the Buddha here. Huh? The purpose of the holy life is to realize the four jhanas, and following that, huh, to attain the higher knowledges, uh, a recollection of past lives, the heavenly eye uh, mentioned here. Uh. So some people uh, nowadays, uh, they belittle concentration and belittle the jhanas, even belittle uh, the psychic powers. Uh, uh, but uh, this is not what the Buddha says. Uh. The Buddha praises the jhanas and praises the psychic powers. Uh, saying uh, it is for the sake of this uh, that monks live the holy life under him uh, to attain the jhanas and to attain the abhinyas, higher knowledges. Uh. And also you notice here, uh, before a monk can attain the knowledge of the recollection of past lives, uh, he has to attain the fourth jhana first. After he has attained the fourth jhana, then the concentrated mind becomes purified, bright, unblemished, rid of imperfection, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attain to imperturbability. Uh, only with this state uh, can you get these abhinyas, uh, higher knowledges arise, uh, knowledge of past lives, etc. Uh. When his concentrated mind is thus purified, bright, unblemished, rid of imperfection, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attain to imperturbability, he directs it to the knowledge of the destruction of the taints. He understands as it actually is. This is suffering. This is the origin of suffering. This is the cessation of suffering. This is the path leading to the cessation of suffering. Uh, similarly for the asavas, the taints. Uh. When he knows and sees thus, his mind is liberated from the taint of sensual desire, from the taint of being, and from the taint of ignorance. When it is liberated, there comes the knowledge, it is liberated. He understands, birth is destroyed, the holy life has been lived. What had to be done has been done. There is no more coming to any state of being. This too, Udayan, is a higher and more sublime state for the sake of realizing which monks lead the holy life under me. These, Udayan, are those higher and more sublime states for the sake of realizing which monks lead the holy life under me. When this was said, the wondrous Akulu Dain said to the Blessed One, Magnificent Venerable Sir, Magnificent Venerable Sir, the Blessed One has made the Dhamma clear in many ways, as though he were turning upright what had been overthrown, revealing what was hidden, showing the way to one who was lost, or holding up a lamp in the dark for those with eyesight to see forms. I go to the Blessed One for refuge, and to the Dhamma, and to the Sangha of monks. I will receive the going forth under the Blessed One, Venerable Sir. I will receive the full ordination. When this was said, the wondrous Akulu Dain's assembly addressed him thus, Do not lead the holy life under recluse Gotama, Master Udain. Having been a teacher, Master Udain, do not live as a pupil. For Master Udain to do so would be as if a water jug were to become a pitcher. Do not lead the holy life under recluse, the recluse Gotama, Master Udain. Having been a teacher, Master Udain, do not live as a pupil. That is how the wonder Sakulu Dain's assembly obstructed him from leading the holy life under the Blessed One. Now, that's the end of the Sutta. So this last part, uh, you see, uh, these uh, disciples of this Udayan, uh, they couldn't understand a word of what the Buddha was saying, uh, so they could not appreciate the Buddha's Dhamma. 
and then they were afraid they'll lose their teacher so they told him don't go and follow this Samana Gotama lah. remain as our teacher lah. uh, so so he did not go forth lah. Mm. this in this sutta there are two things about this sutta one is the the uh, comical part lah, where this uh, this uh, external sex aesthetics lah. they are so ignorant lah. they just keep talking about the the, the the splendor, well, uh, but you cannot really describe the splendor. Uh, and then the other thing that's uh, more important in this sutta, the Buddha says very clearly, uh, monks lead the holy life under him uh, for a few reasons, uh, for realizing the jhanas, uh, up to the four, four jhanas, uh, and then for realizing the abhinyas, the higher knowledges uh, that culminate uh, in the destruction of the asavas, that means uh, uh, arhanhood, uh, attaining liberation. Uh. Okay, we go to the next sutta, number 80, Vekanasa Sutta. To Vekanasa. <clears throat> Thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Savati in Jeta's Grove, Anatta Pindika's Park. Then the wanderer of Vekanasa went with the Blessed One and exchanged greetings with him. When this courteous and amiable talk was finished, he stood at one side, and in the Blessed One's presence he uttered this exclamation This is the perfect splendor. This is the perfect splendor. Now we have another guy here. It is perfect splendor. But Kachana, why do you say this is the perfect splendor? This is the perfect splendor. What is that perfect splendor? Master Gotama, that splendor is the perfect splendor which is unsurpassed by any other splendor, higher or more sublime. But Kachana, what is that splendor that is unsurpassed by any other splendor, higher or more sublime? Master Gotama, that splendor is the perfect splendor that is unsurpassed by any other splendor, higher or more sublime. Kachana, you might continue for a long time in this way. Uh, so what follows uh, is the same as the previous sutta. La. The Buddha shows him uh, uh, that uh, he's talking nonsense. La. Yet you do not indicate what that splendor is. Kachana, there are these five chords of sensual pleasure. What five? Forms cognizable by the eye that are wished for, desired, agreeable and likable, connected with sensual desire and provocative of lust. Sounds cognizable by the ear, odors cognizable by the nose, flavors cognizable by the tongue, tangibles cognizable by the body that are wished for, desired, agreeable and likable, connected with sensual desire and provocative of lust. These are the five chords of sensual pleasure. Now, Kachana, the pleasure and joy that arise dependent on these five chords of sensual pleasure are called sensual pleasure. Thus, sensual pleasure arises through sensual pleasure. But beyond sensual pleasure, there is a pleasure higher than the sensual, and that is declared to be the highest among them. When this was said, the wanderer Vekanasa said, It is wonderful, Master Gotama. It is marvelous how well that has been expressed by Master Gotama. Thus, sensual pleasure arises through sensual pleasures, but beyond sensual pleasure, there is a pleasure higher than the sensual, and that is declared to be the highest among them. And the Buddha said, Kachana, for you who are of another view, who accept another teaching, who approve of another teaching, who pursue a different training, who follow a different teacher, it is hard to know what sensuality is, or what sensual pleasure is, or what the pleasure higher than the sensual is. But those monks who are arahants, with taints destroyed, who have lived the holy life, done what had to be done, laid down the burden, reached the true goal, destroyed the fetters of being, and are completely liberated through final knowledge, it is they who would know what sensuality is, what sensual pleasure is, and what the pleasure higher than the sensual is. When this was said, the wanderer Vekanasa was angry and displeased, and he reviled, disparaged, and censured the Blessed One, saying, the recluse Gotama will be worsted. He then said to the Blessed One, So then there are some recluses and Brahmins here, who without knowing the past and without seeing the future, yet claim, birth is destroyed, the holy life has been lived, what had to be done has been done, there is no more coming to any state of being. 
What they say turns out to be ridiculous. It turns out to be mere words, empty and hollow. Stop here for a moment. Nah. So here, when the Buddha said nah, that you, because you follow a different teacher, nah, you don't know what sensual pleasure is nah, or the pleasure higher than the sensual is. Nah. So he got very angry. Nah. Nah. But actually, sensual pleasure, I guess he should know. Nah, but the pleasure higher than the sensual, nah, he would not know. Nah. So he felt uh, yes, uh, put down, uh, so he got very angry. If any recluses and Brahmins, without knowing the past and without seeing the future, yet claim birth is destroyed, the holy life has been lived, what had to be done has been done, there is no more coming to any state of being. They can be confuted in accordance with the Dhamma. Rather, let the past be Kachana and let the future be. Let a wise man come who is honest and sincere, a man of rectitude. I instruct him, I teach him the Dhamma in such a way that by practicing as instructed, he will soon know and see for himself. Thus indeed, there rightly comes to be liberation from the bond, that is, from the bond of ignorance. Suppose, Kachana, there were a young tender infant lying prone, bound by stout bonds at the four limbs, with the fifth at the neck, and later on, as a result of his growth and the maturing of his faculties, those bonds loosen. Then he would know, I am free, and there would be no more bondage. So too, let a wise man come, etc. I will teach him the Dhamma. Thus indeed, there rightly comes to be liberation from the bond, that is, from the bond of ignorance. When this was said, the wanderer Vekanasa said to the Blessed One, Magnificent Master Gotama, Magnificent Master Gotama, Master Gotama has made the Dhamma clear in many ways, etc. Uh, I go to Master Gotama for refuge and to the Dhamma and to the Sangha of monks. From today, let the Blessed One remember me as a lay follower who has gone to him for refuge for life. That's the end of the Sutta. La. So you see, when the Buddha, uh, this last part, uh, told him uh, that uh, if really uh, a person he doesn't know the past and he cannot see the future, uh, and yet he claims uh, that he, the holy life has been lived, uh, uh, that he's not going to be reborn anymore, then he can be confuted in accordance with the Dhamma. That means um, um, not likely uh, that this person, uh, without knowing the past and seeing the future, can be liberated. Uh. But the Buddha said, uh, if an honest and sincere man, uh, a man of rectitude comes to me, uh, a wise man, uh, I can teach him uh, and he can attain liberation. And this wanderer uh, probably had a, has a high regard for the Buddha uh, and then he believed the Buddha uh, and he took refuge. Uh. Number 81, Gatikara Sutta. Gatikara, the potter, is a very important sutta, famous sutta. Thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was wandering among the Kosalans together with a large Sangha of monks. Then, in a certain place beside the main road, the Blessed One smiled. It occurred to the Venerable Ananda, what is the reason, what is the cause for the Blessed One's smile? The Tathagatas do not smile for no reason. So he arranged his upper robe on one shoulder and extending his hands in reverential salutation towards the Blessed One, asked him, Venerable Sir, what is the reason, what is the cause for the Blessed One's smile? The Tathagatas do not smile for no reason. And the Buddha said, Once Ananda, in this place, there was a prosperous and busy market town called Vebalinga, with many inhabitants and crowded with people. Now the Blessed One Kasapa, Arahan Samasambuddha, lived near the market town Vebalinga. It was here, in fact, that the Blessed One Kasapa, Arahan Samasambuddha, had his monastery. It was here, in fact, that the Blessed One Kasapa, Arahan Samasambuddha, resided and advised the Sangha of monks. Then the Venerable Ananda folded his patchwork cloak in four and spreading it out, said to the Blessed One, Then, Venerable Sir, let the Blessed One be seated. Thus, this place will have been used by two Arahans, Samasam Buddhas. Stop here for a moment. So this uh, place in India where the Buddha walked, uh, he said the previous Buddha, Kasapa. Kasapa was the previous Buddha to our Sakyamuni Buddha. 
and later you'll see uh, that actually the Buddha uh, in his previous life uh, had met this Buddha Kasapa uh, then he became a monk under him uh, so it's interesting uh, uh, such a long time has passed by uh, in this world uh, you know, wherever we are if you can see the past, uh, many things have happened uh, in, in whatever place we have been. Uh. The Blessed One sat down on the seat that had been made ready, and he addressed the Venerable Ananda thus, Once, Ananda, in this place there was a prosperous and busy market town called Vebalinga, with many inhabitants and crowded with people. Now the Blessed One, Kasapa, Arahan Samasambuddha, lived near the market town Vebalinga, it was here, in fact, that the Blessed One Kasapa, Arhan Samasambuddha, had his monastery. It was here, in fact, that the Blessed One Kasapa, Arhan Samasambuddha, resided and advised the Sangha of monks. In Vebalinga, the Blessed One Kasapa, Arhan Samasambuddha, had as a supporter, as his chief supporter, a potter named Gatikara. Gatikara, the potter, had as a friend, as his close friend, a Brahmin student named Jyotipala. Stop here for a while. Huh? So in this sutta, the Buddha is going to recall the past lah, when he was born as the Bodhisatta named Jyotipala, a Brahmin student. And his good friend huh, was Gatikara, the potter. The potter huh, in India is uh, part of the working caste. Lah. Uh, working caste, low caste. Lah. The high caste uh, is the uh, blue blood, lah, the warrior caste, lah, nobles, lah, and the Brahmin caste, lah, the priest caste. These two are the high caste. Lah. The low caste is the merchant class, lah, uh, Vesas, and the, and the worker class. The worker class, they are called the Sudas. Lah, uh, so this Atikara belonged to the low caste, lah, but he was the chief supporter of the Buddha. Arahan Samasambuddha Kasapa. One day the potter Gatikara addressed the Brahmin student Jyotipala thus, My dear Jyotipala, let us go and see the Blessed One Kasapa, Arahan Samasambuddha. I hold that it is good to see that Blessed One, Arahan Samasambuddha. The Brahmin student Jyotipala replied, Enough, my dear Gatikara, what is the use of seeing that ball painter recluse? A second time and third time, the potter Gatikara said, My dear Jyotipala, let us go and see the Blessed One Kasapa, Arahan Samasambuddha. I hold that it is good to see that Blessed One, Arahan Samasambuddha. And the second and the third time, the Brahmin student Jyotipala replied, Enough, my dear Gatikara, what is the use of seeing that ball painter recluse? Then, my dear Jyotipala, let us take a loofah and bath powder and go to the river to bathe. Very well, Jyotipala replied. Mm, stop here for a moment. So here you see uh, Gatikara, he wanted to invite this uh, Jyotipala, his friend, uh, to see his teacher, uh, whom he says is the Arahan Samasambuddha. But this Jyotipala refused to go uh, because Jyotipala was a Brahmin belonging to a different religion uh, and worshipping the Brahma uh, as the creator god. Uh, so he thought of a way, la. he thought, okay, let's go to take a lufa. A lufa is a dried uh, god, la. dried god. La. It is fibrous uh, and it's used as a sponge la, for scrubbing the body. La. So he said, let's go and take a bath. La. These Brahmins, they like to bathe in the river, uh, soak themselves in the river uh, three times before dawn and three times after dusk. Uh. So uh, this uh, Jyotipala agreed to go. La. So the potter Gatikara and the Brahmin student Jyotipala took a lufa and bath powder and went to the river to bathe. Then Gatikara said to Jyotipala, My dear Jyotipala, there is the monastery of the Blessed One Kasapa, Arahan Samasambuddha, quite nearby. Let us go and see the Blessed One, Kasapa, Arahan Samasambuddha. I hold that it is good to see that Blessed One, Arahan Samasambuddha. Jyotipala replied, Enough, my dear Gatikara, what is the use of seeing that ball painter recluse? A second and third time, Gatikara said, My dear Jyotipala, there is the monastery of the Blessed One, Kasapa, etc. And the second and third time, the Brahmin student Jyotipala replied, enough, enough, my dear Gatikara, what is the use of seeing that ball painter recluse? Then the potter Gatikara seized the Brahmin student Jyotipala by the belt 
and said, My dear Jyotipala, there is the monastery of the Blessed One Kasapa, Arahan Samasam Buddha, quite nearby. Let us go and see the Blessed One. Kasapa, Arahan Samasam Buddha. I hold that it is good to see that Blessed One, Arahan Samasam Buddha. Then the Brahmin student Jyotipala undid his belt and said, Enough, my dear Gatikara, what is the use of seeing that ball painter recluse? Then when the Brahmin student Jyotipala had washed his head, the potter Gatikara seized him by the hair and said, My dear Jyotipala, there is the monastery of the Blessed One Kasapa, Arahan Samasam Buddha, quite nearby. Let us go and see the Blessed One Kasapa, Arahan Samasam Buddha. I hold that it is good to see that Blessed One, Arahan Samasam Buddha. Then the Brahmin student Jyotipala thought, It is wonderful, it is marvelous that this potter Gatikara who is of a different birth, should presume to seize me by the hair when we have washed our heads. Surely this can be no simple matter. And he said to the potter Gatikara, You go as far as this, my dear Gatikara. I go as far as this, my dear Jyotipala. For so much do I hold that it is good to see that blessed one, Arahan Samasam Buddha. Then, my dear Gatikara, let go of me. Let us visit him. I stop here for a moment. Nah? Uh, so you see, uh, this uh, Gatikara, uh, he tries so hard uh, to bring this uh, Jyotipala, his good friend, to see the Buddha. Uh, each time he refused. Uh, ask him three times or so, he refused. And then after bathing, ask him to go and again, and again three times, again he refused. And he pulled him by the, by the belt. Uh, uh, and uh, pulled him by the belt, also he refused to go. Uh, and then he felt uh, there was no choice. Uh, seize him by the hair, uh, pull him by the hair. Now this uh, Gatikara, being a low caste uh, person, uh, is what we call haram, uh, not allowed to seize this, uh, even touch the hair of this Brahmin, because this Brahmin is a high caste. Uh, possibly, uh, if he re this, this uh, Brahmin reported to his other Brahmins, uh, they might even uh, kill this, this, this worker uh, Gatikara. Uh, so he was surprised la, that he dared to go so far uh, to, to, to make him go to see the Buddha. Then his friend said uh, he's, he's willing, he, he goes so far because he, he thinks uh, it's very important uh, to see the, the Buddha. Then only uh, Jyotipala agreed. La. So Gatikara the potter and Jyotipala the Brahmin student went to the Blessed One Kasapa, Arahan Samasam Buddha. Gatikara, after paying homage to him, sat down at one side, while Jyotipala exchanged greetings with him, and when this courteous and amiable talk was finished, he too sat down at one side. Gatikara then said to the Blessed One, Kasapa, Arahan Samasam Buddha, Remember, Sir, this is the Brahmin student Jyotipala, my friend, my close friend. Let the Blessed One teach him the Dhamma. Mm. Stop here for a moment. Uh. You see, uh, according to legend, uh, uh, they say uh, that the Buddha in his past life, uh, our Sakyamuni Buddha uh, in his past life, uh, met 24 Buddhas. Uh, and each of them uh, predicted uh, that one day he will become the Buddha Sakyamuni. Uh, uh, and also that the Buddha in his past life, uh, made a vow uh, to become a Samasam Buddha. Uh, uh, but you see here uh, that uh, it cannot really be true. Uh, if the Buddha actually um, made this vow to become a Samasam Buddha, uh, he would be very happy uh, to meet a Samasam Buddha. Uh, but here you see uh, he had not much respect for the for the Samasam Buddha, refused to see him so many times uh, and eventually when he was pulled by the hair uh, and when he went, uh, also he refused to pay respect to the Buddha. He just uh, exchanged his uh, greetings with the Buddha and sat down. Uh, uh. So this legend uh, is based on the Jataka stories and uh, on the Paramis and all this. Uh. Which, uh, which is not in the suttas, la. it was a later creation. La. In the suttas we find, uh, the Buddha said, uh, he looked into the past as far as he could see uh, uh, that night. La. He probably didn't sleep the whole night. La. He looked into the past, 91 world cycles. Uh, and he said uh, he only saw six Samasambuddhas. 
Uh, in the suttas, uh, there's no mention of 24 Buddhas or 28 Buddhas or 88 Buddhas, etc. Only six Samasam Buddhas are mentioned. And out of these six, uh, our Sakyamuni Buddha in his past life uh, only met one, met this Kasapa Buddha. Uh, and even in this sutta, you find uh, that the Buddha never predicted, uh, Kasapa Buddha never predicted that Jyotipala one day would be a Samasam Buddha. Uh, uh, so any, anybody, uh, uh, it's up to whether that person uh, uh, takes the trouble uh, to teach the Dhamma or not. Uh. Like our Buddha, after he was enlightened, uh, he actually refused to teach. Uh. He wanted to be a Pacheka Buddha, but was persuaded to. Uh, uh. Okay, then the Blessed One Kasapa, Arahan Samasam Buddha, instructed, urged, roused, and encouraged Gatikara, the potter, and Jyotipala, the Brahmin student, with an exposition of the Dhamma. At the conclusion of the exposition, having delighted and rejoiced in the Blessed One Kasapa's words, they rose from their seats, and after paying homage to the Blessed One Kasapa, Arahan Samasam Buddha, keeping him on their right, they departed. Stop here for a moment. So you see, this Jyotipala, when he came to see the Buddha, he didn't have much respect for the Buddha. But after hearing the Dhamma, he was willing to pay homage to the Buddha. That means he understood the Dhamma. Uh, later you see, uh, most likely, he just hearing that Dhamma from the Buddha Kasapa, he attained uh, this um, stream entry. Then Jyotipala asked Gatikara, now that you have heard this Dhamma, my dear Gatikara, why don't you go forth from the home life into homelessness? And Gatikara said, My dear Jyotipala, don't you know that I support my blind and aged parents? And Jyotipala said, Then my dear Gatikara, I shall go forth from the home life into homelessness. So Gatikara the potter and Jyotipala the Brahmin student went to the Blessed One Kasapa, Arahan Samasam Buddha. After paying homage to him, they sat down at one side. And Gatikara the potter said to the Blessed One Kasapa, Arahan Samasam Buddha, Venerable Sir, this is the Brahmin student Jyotipala, my friend, my close friend. Let the Blessed One give him the going forth. And the Brahmin student Jyotipala received the going forth from the Blessed One, Kasapa, Arahan Samasam Buddha, and he received the full ordination. Uh, so you see, uh, just after listening to the Dhamma by the Buddha Kasapa, this Jyotipala, whom earlier uh, did not have faith, did not have respect for the Buddha, he understood the Dhamma and decided to go forth. Uh, it's very clear from here. Uh, that he must have attained stream entry. Uh. Then not, not long after Jyotipala, the Brahmin student, had received the full ordination, a half month after he had received the full ordination, the Blessed One Kasapa, Arahan Samasam Buddha, having stayed at Vebalinga as long as he chose, set out to wander towards Banares. Wandering by stages, he eventually arrived at Banares, and there he went to live in the deer park at Isipatana. Now King Kiki of Kasi heard, it seems that the Blessed One, Kasapa, Arahan Samasam Buddha, has reached Benares and is living in the deer park at Isipatana. So he had a number of state carriages made ready, and mounting a state carriage, drove out from Benares with the full pomp of royalty in order to see the Blessed One, Kasapa, Arahan Samasam Buddha. He went thus as far as the road was possible for carriages, and then he got down from his carriage and went forward on foot to the Blessed One, Kasapa, Arahan Samasam Buddha. After paying homage to him, he sat down at one side. And the Blessed One, Kasapa, Arahan Samasam Buddha, instructed, urged, roused, and encouraged King Kiki of Kasi with an exposition of the Dhamma. At the conclusion of the exposition, King Kiki of Kasi said, Remember, sir, let the Blessed One, together with the Sangha of monks, consent to accept tomorrow's meal from me. And the Blessed One, Kasapa, Arahan Samasam Buddha, accepted in silence. Then knowing that the Blessed One, Kasapa, Arahan Samasam Buddha, had accepted, he rose from his seat, and after paying homage to him, keeping him on his right, he departed. Then when the night had ended, King Kiki of Kasi had good food of various kinds, prepared in his own dwelling, red rice stored in the sheaf, with the dark grains picked out, along with many sauces and curries. And he had the time announced to the Blessed One, Kasapa, Arhan Samasam Buddha, thus, It is time, Venerable Sir, the meal is ready. 
Then it being morning, the Blessed One Kasapa, Arahan Samasambuddha, dressed and taking his bowl and outer robe, he went with the Sangha of monks to the dwelling of King Kiki of Kasi and sat down on the seat made ready. Then with his own hands, King Kiki of Kasi served and satisfied the Sangha of monks, headed by the Buddha with the various kinds of good food. When the Blessed One Kasapa, Arahan Samasambuddha, had eaten and had withdrawn his hand from the bowl, King Kiki of Kasi took a low seat, sat down at one side and said, Remember, sir, let the Blessed One accept from me a residence for the rains in Banares. That will be helpful for the Sangha. Enough, King. My residence for the rains has already been provided for. A second and third time, King Kiki of Kasi said, Remember, sir, let the Blessed One accept from me a residence for the rains in Banares. That will be helpful for the Sangha. Enough, king. My residence for the rains has already been provided for. The king thought, The Blessed One Kasapa, Arahan Samasambuddha, does not accept from me a residence for the rains. And he was very disappointed and sad. Then he said, Venerable Sir, have you a better supporter than I am? And the Buddha said, I have, great king. There is a market town called Vebalinga, where a potter named Gatikara lives. He is my supporter, my chief supporter. I stop here for a moment. Uh. So here you see, uh, when the Bud- uh, when the King Kiki uh, invited the Buddha Kasapa uh, to stay uh, for the rains, uh, the three months of the rains retreat uh, um, in his place, uh, which he is going to provide for, uh, the uh, Buddha Kasapa refused to accept, uh, saying that he already has a place. Uh, then the king said, you mean you have a better supporter than me? And then the, 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 the Buddha, being so straightforward, uh, he said, yes, I have. <laughs> and he says, uh, he has this uh, supporter uh, named Gatikara. He's just a porter, uh, a low caste man. Uh, yet the Buddha says, uh, he's a better, better supporter uh, than the king. And here the, then, then he explains why. Uh. Now you, great king, thought, the Blessed One Kasapa Arahan Samasambuddha does not accept from me a residence for the rains in Banares, and you were very disappointed and sad. But the potter Gatikara is not, and will not be so. The potter, the potter Gatikara has gone for refuge to the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha. He abstains from killing living beings, from taking what is not given, from misconduct in sensual pleasures, from false speech and from wine, liquor, and intoxicants, which are the basis for negligence. He has perfect confidence in the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha, and he possesses the virtues loved by noble ones. In other words, uh, he is an Ariyala. He is free from doubt about suffering, about the origin of suffering, about the cessation of suffering, about the way leading to the cessation of suffering. He eats only in one part of the day. He observes celibacy. He is virtuous, of good character, has laid aside gems and gold. He has given up gold and silver, that means money. He does not dig the ground for clay, using a pick with his own hand. What is left over from embankments or thrown up by rats, he brings home in a carrier. When he has made a pot, he says, let anyone who likes set down some selected rice or selected beans or selected lentils and let him take away whatever he likes. He supports his blind and aged parents. Having destroyed the five lower fetters, he is one who will reappear spontaneously in the pure abodes and there attain final Nibbana without ever returning from that world. i stop here for a moment. So here, the Buddha Kasapa is making clear to the king why Gatikara is a better supporter because Gatikara is an Arya, a third fruition Arya. So for somebody like the Buddha, doesn't mean this person is the king or is the richest man in the whole country, then he's a good supporter. The Buddha's standard is that this Gatikara is a man who knows the Dhamma or practices the Dhamma, is an Arya. That's why to the Buddha, this Gatikara is a better supporter. On one occasion, the Buddha said, When I was living at Vebalinga, it being morning, I dressed, and taking my bowl and outer robe, I went to the potter, Gatikara's parents, and asked them, Where has the potter gone, please? And they said, Venerable Sir, your supporter has gone out, but take rice from the cauldron and sauce from the saucepan and eat. 
I did so and went away. Then the potter Gatikara went to his parents and asked, Who has taken rice from the cauldron and sauce from the saucepan, eaten and gone away? My dear, the Blessed One Kasapa, Arahan Samasam Buddha, did. Then the potter Gatikara thought, It is a gain for me. It is great. It is a great gain for me that the Blessed One Kasapa, Arahan Samasam Buddha, relies on me thus. And delight and happiness never left him for a half month or his parents for a week. Mm, stop here for a moment. Huh? So here, normally according to the monk's rules, huh, when a monk goes on arms round, huh, the food, huh, uh, even, even uh, in a house or in a monastery, you know, when they offer food to a monk, uh, it's got to, it has to be handed to the monk's hands, uh, given uh, personally to the monk's hands. Then only uh, it's considered offered. Uh. But here, uh, in this case, uh, when the Buddha Kasapa went to Gatikara's house, uh, Gatikara was not in the house. And his blind parents, uh, knowing that it was the Buddha, uh, just asked him to help himself. Uh. And he helped himself, uh, took away the food and went away. Uh. So when Gatikara came back, uh, he asked who took, uh, who took the rice. Uh, and then his parents told him uh, the Buddha took. Uh. He was so happy uh, that the Buddha uh, sort of uh, treated him uh, as somebody very close. Uh, that even without offering, uh, uh, the Buddha is, is, takes it. Uh. So he was delighted uh, and happy for two weeks. Uh. Uh, a whole two weeks and his parents were delighted and happy for a whole week. Mm. On another occasion, when I was living at Vebalinga, it being morning, I dressed and taking my bowl and outer robe, I went to the potter, Gatikara's parents, and asked them, Where has the potter gone, please? Honorable sir, your supporter has gone out, but take some porridge from the vessel and sauce from the saucepan and eat. I did so and went away. Then the potter, Gatikara, went to his parents and asked, Who has taken porridge from the vessel and sauce from the saucepan, eaten and gone away? My dear, the Blessed One, Kasapa, Arahan, Samasam Buddha, did. Then the potter, Gatikara, thought, It is a gain for me, it is a great gain for me, that the Blessed One, Kasapa, Arahan, Samasam Buddha, relies on me thus. And delight and happiness never left him for a half month, or for his or his parents for a week. Stop here for a moment. So in a similar way, on another day, this occurred again. Again, he was delighted non-stop for two weeks and his parents for one a week. On another occasion, when I was living at Vebalinga, my heart leaked. That means my kuti leaked. Then I addressed the monks thus, Go monks and find out if there is any grass at the potter Gatikara's house. Venerable Sir, there is no grass at the potter Gatikara's house, but, but there is the grass thatch on his roof. Go, monks, and remove the grass from the potter Gatikara's house. They did so. Then the potter Gatikara's parents asked the monks, Who is removing the grass from the house? Sister, the hut of the Blessed One, Kasapa, Arahan Samasam Buddha, is leaking. And they said, Take it, Venerable Sirs, take it and bless you. Then the potter, Gatikara, went to his parents and asked, Who has removed the grass from the roof? The monks did, my dear. The hut of the Blessed One, Kasapa, Arahan, Samasam Buddha, is leaking. Then the potter, Gatikara, thought, It is a gain for me, it is a great gain for me, that the Blessed One, Kasapa, Arahan, Samasam Buddha, relies on me thus. And the delight and happiness never left him for a half month, or his parents for a week. Then that house remained three whole months, with the sky for a roof, and yet no rain came in. Such is the potter Gatikara. And the king said, It is gain for the potter Gatikara. It's a great gain for him that the Blessed One, Kasapa, Arahan, Sam, Sama, Sambuddha, relies on him thus. Uh, stop here for a moment. So this last part is quite interesting. When the Buddha's kuti was leaking, that means the, the Buddha's kuti had this atap roof, this grass, grass thatch roof. So because it was leaking, there was a hole in it. And the Buddha asked his monks to get it from Gatikara, but Gatikara did not have a store of, of this dry grass. So the, the Buddha asked them to remove from his roof. And they did so. And, and this Gatikara and his parents were overjoyed. 
uh, Gatikara for two weeks and his parents for one week. And for the whole three months uh, of the of the rains, probably it was a rain season. Uh, it rained everywhere except on that roof. <laughs> Then King Kiki of Kasi dispatched to the potter Gatikara 500 cartloads of red rice stored in the sheaf and also source materials to go with it. Then the king's men went to the potter Gatikara and told him, Remember, sir, there are 500 cartloads of red rice stored in the sheaf and also source materials to go with it. Dispatched to you by King Kiki of Kasi. Please accept them. And he said, The king is very busy and has much to do. I have enough. Let this be for the king himself. Now, Ananda, you may think thus, certainly someone else was the Brahmin student Jyotipala on that occasion, but it should not be regarded thus. I was the Brahmin student Jyotipala on that occasion. That is what the Blessed One said. The verbal Ananda was satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. Uh, that's the end of the sutta. So this last part, uh, when the king uh, knew uh, that the... Uh, the Buddha and the Sangha of monks uh, was going to be supported uh, for the whole Vasa uh, rain season uh, uh, by Gatikara. He dispatched uh, 500 cartloads of rice, etc. But this uh, Gatikara uh, just didn't want to accept it. Uh, uh, he said he has enough. Uh, uh, so he's not a greedy fellow. Uh, so this sutta is extremely um, informative la, as to the past life of the Buddha. This is the only one sutta in, in the whole of the Nikayas, uh, our 5,000 suttas, uh, that mentions uh, our Buddha in his previous life, uh, having met another Buddha. Uh, this is the only one. Uh, so you can see from here, uh, you see, when we read suttas, uh, we that we have to in, we have to there's a lot of implications, you know. We have to think carefully, uh, and then we can understand a lot of things, lah. Like. Firstly, you can see from this sutta that the Buddha in this lifetime, uh, under the Buddha Kasapa, he must have attained a stream entry, like. and after attaining stream entry, he became a monk under this Buddha Kasapa, and then from there. Uh, he was reborn. This is mentioned in some other suttas. La. After that lifetime, he was reborn in the Tusita heaven, where he was, he was there for quite a long time. La. And after the Tusita heaven, he came down la, um, as the Siddhartha Gautama, his last life. La. Uh, and in the uh, Vinaya books, uh, it is mentioned uh, that our Siddhartha Gautama, as a young boy, uh, he could enter the first jhana under the jambu tree. Uh, and in the suttas, the Buddha says, uh, all these uh, uh, meditative states uh, uh, are not attained in the heavens. It is attained in the human realm. Uh, which means uh, the first jhana that the Siddhartha Gautama uh, uh, practiced, uh, he could... He must have attained it uh, when he was a monk uh, under the Buddha Kasapa. Uh. So he, he had already attained stream entry uh, in that lifetime. And on top of that, uh, he had attained the first jhana. Uh. It is logical uh, that he must have become a second uh, fruition Arya, uh, Sakadagamin, uh, Sakadagamin uh, already uh, under the Buddha Kasapa. Uh. Now, according to the suttas, uh, Asaka the Gamin is called a once returner. That means uh, he goes to heaven, uh, then after that uh, he comes back uh, to be a human being uh, for one last time. Uh, he's a once returner, he comes back one, one last time as a human being. Uh, as a human being, uh, he must enter Nibbana. Uh, that explains very clearly uh, why uh, our Siddhartha Gautama, uh, as a young man at the age of 29, uh, having just uh, married and having uh, just had a son uh, uh, with such a good family background, uh, such a good life. Uh, he just left the parents, uh, even though his parents cried and wailed. Uh, in front of his parents, uh, he cut off his hair, put on the yellow robe and walked out of the house. Uh, his parents pleaded with him uh, not to go also in front of them. Uh, he left. Mm. This uh, ordinary, ordinary person uh, cannot do. Uh, mm. It's only an Arya. 
because an Arya, his time is ripe already, just like a durian fruit, a fruit, a ripe fruit. You don't, you don't need the wind to shake it. It will just drop by itself. So when a person's time has come, uh, he just has to go off. So that explains why the Buddha in his last life, as Siddhartha Gautama left and struggled so hard and attained enlightenment. You see, when, he, when the Buddha in his last life, he struggled so hard, he could not attain enlightenment until he recollected his past life. When he recollected his past life, then he realized that he had been a monk under the Buddha Kasapa. And when he remembered that lifetime, all the Dhamma that he had learned came back to him. Without the Dhamma, nobody can become enlightened. So when he remembered the Dhamma he had learned, then he contemplated on the Four Noble Truths. Then when he contemplated on the Four Noble Truths, then only he became enlightened. Okay, we stop here. is mentioned that this uh, world cycle uh, we will have five Samasam Buddhas uh, so three have already gone by before our Sakyamuni Buddha and it seems that all these Buddhas uh, they appear in this place of India called Majima Padesa Majima Padesa this is a middle middle country uh. Uh, so in the Ganges Valley uh, So uh, that's why uh, the Buddha was also around that area Our, our present uh, Sakyamuni Buddha uh, That's why when he came to that place uh, he smiled uh, He smiled and then Venerable Ananda asked him uh, So they, they, they are all around that, that area uh. So you see because of this uh, word Majima Padesa uh, They translated, translated into Chinese uh, as Chung Kuo, middle country, uh, they translate as Chung Kuo. So, uh, a lot of Mahayana monks uh, in their books, uh, they say uh, all the Buddhas appear in China because of the word Chung Kuo. That's why they have this legend uh, that Maha Kasapa is now uh, in deep Samadhi uh, in Chicken Foot Mountain in China, waiting for the next Buddha to come. <laughs> of course, uh, there's no such thing. Uh, the Arhan has entered Ibana, he doesn't enter Samadhi to wait for the Buddha. Uh, uh. So, uh, all of these uh, stories uh, are way out. Uh. You see, uh, that's why there are two things. La. One thing is uh, the Buddha made these precepts for the monks, uh, but he is not uh, bound by these precepts. La. Because you must realize a lot of these precepts, uh, uh, if a monk breaks the precepts, uh, uh, there is no uh, moral misconduct. La. A lot of these precepts were made by the Buddha uh, just to uh, give a good image of the Sangha. Uh, like the food has to be offered in the monk's hands and all that. Uh, uh, just to give a good... Uh, but uh, the Buddha also said uh, that we should not be too attached uh, to these precepts. Uh, because if a monk is too attached to these precepts, uh, then he cannot become a Sotapanna. Because when a person becomes a Sotapanna, three factors are eliminated. One of them uh, 
is uh, sila bata paramasa. Uh, attachment to sila, rules, uh, and vata. Vata is uh, all the observances, uh, all the religious observances. Uh, all the religious observances. Uh. So, uh, the Buddha said uh, we must uh, understand uh, the purpose. Uh, whatever we do, we must understand. For example, these uh, precepts. Uh, there is uh, there's a purpose uh, for them. Uh, so, so like in, in this case, uh, um, since the Buddha Kasapa uh, is so close to this uh, Katikara that uh, he knows uh, that if he takes by himself, uh, Katikara is not going to be offended. Uh, so in the same way, sometimes uh, uh, like, like forest monks, uh, uh, there are certain close supporters, uh, even though there is a rule uh, that uh, a monk uh, should not ask something from a lay supporter uh, unless he has given an invitation. Uh, that means he has invited the monk uh, to ask whenever he needs something. Uh. But there are certain supporters we know uh, that are very close to us. Uh. So we know they are, not, they are going to be very happy uh, if we ask them for something, uh, provided it's not uh, overboard. Uh. No, it's something ordinary, no, not something that is too expensive or something. Then, if we know the 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 uh, this uh, lay person is going to be happy uh, to 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 provide, uh, then we ask, uh, even though he does not uh, give that invitation. So we have to see the situation. Uh, Uh, this attachment to rules and rituals uh, is, um, as I mentioned, uh, that uh, we must know the purpose uh, of the rules uh, and uh, not to uh, follow them blindly. Uh. For example, there is a rule uh, forbidding a monk uh, to touch a lady uh, out of lust. Uh, uh. So because of that, uh, uh, for example, in Thailand, uh, monks uh, try to have no contact with women at all. Uh. That's why when uh, women offer food or anything uh, to a monk, uh, a Thai monk will put out a cloth. Uh. He does not accept, accept, it, accept the, the thing uh, directly from the woman's hands. He puts out a cloth for the woman to put the thing. Uh, uh. But uh, although there is such a rule, uh, but um, we must not go too far. Uh. For example, to me, uh, my personal uh, opinion, uh, of course, uh, some monks may not agree. Uh. If I see a woman about to fall down, uh, stumbling, uh, I think I should go and help her lah, so that she don't fall on her face or something. Uh, uh, so we have to use our wisdom lah, not to be so attached. Uh, that you see a woman falling or so, uh, you refuse to help her uh, and she falls on the ground. Uh, or if a woman falls into the drain or something, uh, and it needs your help, you go and pull, pull her out. Lah. Doesn't matter whether it's a woman or a man or a dog, <laughs> anything, an animal needs your help. You just help. I don't think so much. Uh -huh. If you think of all your precepts, oh, I cannot touch that woman, cannot help her out the drain. All this, then there's this attachment. Uh -huh. So we have to uh, use our wisdom. Uh -huh. There's no hard and fast rule. Uh -huh. No, no hard and fast rule. Well, of course, uh, having said that, uh, also we have to be very careful uh, that uh, we don't make some excuse uh, to break the precept. Uh. Sometimes uh, some monks, uh, uh, they, you know, because our mind is very cunning, uh, you can always think up some excuse uh, not to hold the precept. Uh. So we have to be very careful. Mm. For example, money precept. Some monks say, uh, uh, this is a modern world, uh, without money you cannot travel and all these things, uh, so it's alright to accept money. But then you must know, uh, even though money, accepting money is not a major precept, uh, but uh, it can create a very 
poor image lah of the monk, uh, bad image of the monk. So also if a monk accepts money, uh, then uh, there's the danger uh, that he will use it in the wrong way lah, uh, to enjoy what he should not enjoy. Lah. That's why the Buddha forbade uh, monks from possessing money. Lah. Mm-hmm. You have to be careful. Lah. Okay, let's stop here. Yeah? Ah, uh, uh.